Hello, welcome back to another video. I'm going to be reading a short passage today from a book, which I just discovered on Twitter. A little fascinating tidbit about immigration some of you may not have known. Enjoy. The ADL led the charge behind changing our immigration law in 1965, despite Americans being overwhelmingly opposed to it. But immigration policy in the post-war years attracted a small but growing body of opponents, the political core of a coalition pressing for a new, more liberalized policy regime was composed of ethnic lobbyists, professional immigrant handlers, Representative Francis Walter called them, claiming to speak for nationalities migrating prior to the National Origins Act of 1924, the most effective being Jews from Central and Eastern Europe who are deeply concerned with the rise of fascism and anti-Semitism on the continent and eternally interested in Haven. Unable by themselves to interest many polit politicians or the media in the settled issue of America's immigration law, law, these groups hoped for new circumstances in which restrictions could be dis discredited and the old regime of open doors restored. The arrival of the civil rights movement thrust racial discrimination into the center of national self-examination. The enemy, everywhere at the bottom of virtually every national blemish, seemed to be discrimination. The historic, now intolerable subordination, subordinating classification of groups, the basis of inherited characteristics, the nation's national origins grounded immigration laws could not escape an assault by these reformist passions, and critics of the national origins system found the liberal wing of the Democratic Party receptive to their demand that immigration reform should be a part of the civil rights agenda. Who would lead and formulate what alternatives? Massachusetts Senator John F. Kennedy cautiously stepped out on the issue in the 1950s, sensing that a liberalization stance would gather vital ethnic voting blocks for his long-planned run for the presidency. His work on a refugee bill caught the attention of officials of the Anti-Defamation League of Benai Birth, who convinced Kennedy to become an author of a pamphlet on immigration with the help of an ADL-supplied historian, Arthur Mann, and Kennedy's staff. The result was a nation of immigrants, a 1958 bouquet of praise for the contributions of immigrants and a call for an end to the racist, morally embarrassing national origin system. The little book was initially ignored, but its arguments would dominate the emerging debate. The ADL, part of a Jewish coalition, whose agenda included opening wider the American gates so that in increasing U.S. ethnic heterogeneity would reduce. The chances of a populist mass movement embracing anti-Semitism had made a golden alliance. John F. Kennedy was no crusader on immigration or anything else, but he was an, active, was an, an activist young president by 1961 comfortable with immigration reform as part of his agenda. Elected on a party platform that pledged elimination of the national origin system. Whatever Congress might have had in mind on immigration, it was understood that real action waited on the president's ag agenda. Since Kennedy's 1960 victory has had been narrow, he moved very slowly on sensitive issues, especially those where he expected formidable resistance. The death in May 1963 of staunch defender of the national origin system, Congressman Francis Walter, came just as Kennedy was finally moving on civil rights legislation, and it seemed natural to link the two causes whose joint tar target, by long agreement among liberals, was discrimination. Kennedy sent a special message on immigration to Congress in July, asking for repeal of a policy that discriminates among applicants for administration admission into the U.S. on the basis of the ancient accident of birth. And since the basis of the census of 1920 is arbitrary, the entire system is without basis in either logic or reason. The Asia-Pacific Triangle limits should be abolished at once. National origins quotas ended in five years to be replaced by a selection system based on individual skill and family reunification. First come, first serve. 
there would be a minimal increase in the total numbers from 157,000 quota immigrants to 165,000. Reform never meant increased numbers, as the reformers constantly assured the public. This initiative, along with the rest of the Kennedy program, was inherited by Lyndon Johnson after the assassination. He also inherited Kennedy's determined reformist advisors on immigration, among them Meyer Feldman, Norbert Schley, and Abba Schwartz. He later convinced the new president to endorse reform in his 1964 State of the Union address and to hold a meeting with ethnic leaders where Johnson repeated the key slogan of the attack on the national origin system, We ought to never ask, in what country were you born? Still, expansionist reformers privately were pessimistic. In the words of the American Jewish Committee's lobbyist in Washington, there is no great public demand for immigration reform, which is a very minor issue. It was indeed a minor issue to the public, not on the radar screen in a decade overheating with social movements and an escalating war in Southeast Asia. Liberal reformers discovered after John Kennedy's assassination that legislating social change could be accomplished even when only the policy elites, if not the larger public, recognized a problem needing a solution. There was, emer there was emerging on the immigration question, a pattern in public debate that could be found on many issues. Elite opinion makers selected a problem and a liberal policy solution, while grassroots opinion, unfocused and marginalized, ran strongly the other way. Editorials in papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post, or in national magazines such as the Saturday Evening Post, denounced the national origin system as the equivalent of Jim Crow and endorsed repeal of it, saying little more about an alternative. As historian Betty Coed observed in her history of the 1965 Act, editorials and letters to the editor in smaller cities and towns revealed widespread condemnation of the new immigration bill and of the idea of liberalizing immigration policy. Legislative hearings began in the House in summer 1964, while the Senate was engaged in something more pressing, but some thought closely related passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which barred discrimination on the basis of race, creed, religion, sex, and national origin. This language in the, in the civil rights legislation attracted frowning attention to the immigration status quo. How could the U.S. exert world leadership, Congressman Emanuel Seller asked, if our current immigration system was, quote, a gratuitous insult to many nations, end quote, because of its race-conscious bias. The national origin system was not based on race, but nationality. But in the intense climate of the civil rights crusade, the two were easily elided into equivalent evils, impermissible factors in decision-making. The law treated nationalities unequally. Senator Paul Douglas said, and while, quote, it would be impossible to draw up a law restricting immigration without discriminating somehow between those who are admitted and those who are not, end quote, we should end the, quote, basically unjust criterion of national origin for a more, quote, equitable formula, end quote, presumably discrimination on some more defensible basis. Preference categories for professionals and relatives seemed to him more equitable. We need an, quote, Im we need, quote, an immigration policy reflecting America's ideal of equally equality of all men without regard to race, color, creed, or national origin, end quote. And Senator Hiram Fong of Hawaii, when the, sa when the Senate opened hearings in 1965, quote, theories of ethnic superiority, end quote, must no longer be the basis for immigration law, stated the bill's chief, Senate sponsor Philip Hart of Michigan. Against such sentiments, an American Legion spokesman countered that, quote, it is in the best interest of our country to maintain the present makeup of our cultural and social structure, end quote. In the context of the Cold War and the civil rights struggle, there seemed considerably more energy and pertinence in the reformers' arguments. The national origin system was on the defensive now, ironically joined at the hip with Jim Crow. Yet how could immigration reformers change a policy regime that was widely popular? A Harris poll released in May 1965 showed the public strongly opposed to 
to easing of immigration laws by a two-to-one margin, 58% to 24%. This must have discouraged immigration liberalizers, but they knew that a burst of great society legislation was beginning to pour through Congress in the mid-60s, most of it not generated out of the public demand or even understanding, but out of the unique circumstances created by Kennedy's death. Johnson's legislative skills and the intellectual and political collapse of American conservatism and the defenders of the national origin system, those who understood its complexities, seemed intellectually on the defensive. Few seemed able to match the blunt counterattack made by a decade earlier by former State Department visa office head Robert C. Alexander in an article in the American Legion magazine in 1956. Quote, what do the opponents of the national origins quota system want when they glibly advocate action which would result in a change in the ethnological composition of our people? Perhaps they should tell us what is wrong with our national origins. Still, end quote. Still, a major problem for defenders of the existing system was flaws they were forced to acknowledge. Up to two-thirds of the immigration flows after World War II had come outside the quotas as entrants from the Western Hemisphere and refugees. The system had become a Swiss cheese of loopholes, with the result that annual numbers had been rising and the cultural background of immigrants was not what the system was designed to produce. Complex maneuvering produced a House version of the administration's legislation that ended national origins quotas and shifted to a system of preferences based on family reunification and skills. Senator Sam Irvin of North Carolina was the only member of the subcommittee on immigration defending the national origin system during hearings. Irvin met with met every administration witness with the argument that you could not draft any immigration law in which you did not discriminate and that you favor, and that is the end of the excerpt. Next excerpt from the following tweet. The ADL played a key role in changing our immigration laws, commissioning JFK's A Nation of Immigrants book in lead up to 1965 Immigration Act. Taken from Wikipedia, the book was written by Kennedy in 1958 while he was still a senator. It was written as part of the Anti-Defamation League series entitled The One Nation Library. In the 1950s, former ADL National Director Ben Epstein was concerned by rising xenophobia and anti-immigrant rhetoric, so he reached out to then-Senator Kennedy to write a manuscript on immigration reform. And, of course, we've been reading passages taken from history professor Otis Graham's, quote, a vast social experiment. Alrighty. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that.